Finn banged a pillow twice and that got him an Emmy. That sentence is completely insane yet somehow factually accurate. Adventure Time is famous for many, many things. Wacky hijinks, colorful characters, nightmare fuel, deep melancholy inducing existential dread, and Finn's love life. But if there's ever an episode that showed just the strange blistering heights that only Adventure Time could reach, it's Bahoy. As Finn fucked a pillow and died, yet somehow the show just expects us to act like nothing happened. This only made all the more galling with how the episode slapped us in the face with stoic philosophy and how our inability to live up to those ideals is what makes us human, not failures. We need to talk about this episode. I need to talk about it as it is something else. Not to mention it has the best innuendo in cartoon history. Where I'm from, blankets and pillows are used for bedding. <laughs> well, they're used for that here, too. God damn. That line will never stop being funny to me. And then you just know Finn kept his pillows warm from then on. But real context. Finn, the human and future recipient of trauma, was having a bit of a low day. Shockingly, this had nothing to do with the sky raining knives. As yes, that's normal. And no, I can't explain it. What I can explain is Finn's sad boy state. The dude was bummed, cause he's 15 and his girlfriend doesn't think he's that funny. Which is the hyperbolic, hormonal way of saying he told one singular joke that didn't land, and that was yesterday, but he's still not over it. I told her a joke the other day, and she didn't even laugh or anything. Guess it's over between us. That's it? Bruh. Now, I know this sounds crazy, because it is, but he's also 15 and everyone is running on stupidity and assumptions back then, especially when it comes to dating. This is Finn's first serious girlfriend, so her not laughing at a joke would be enough to send him spiraling into the abyss. As Flame Princess is fire, his last crush was a piece of gum, and he hasn't figured out how to act. It's all part of the learning pains of growing up, and while you can tell it's an overreaction, you understand why this is the reaction he's having having. So with nothing to do cause raining knives, Finn has nothing to distract himself from his worst enemy, his thoughts. Despite his dog brother Jake's attempts to cheer him up with a pillow fort. But then, Big Brother finds out why Finn's depressed. That's it? A joke? Yeah, the second Jake finds out what's actually going on, the grown man is, he's not impressed. But he does try to set his little bro straight on how to deal with his issues. This is literally my favorite cup. Huh. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but not by much. See, Jake's advice to Finn is to stop worrying. That life is filled with struggles and stress, so to focus on imaginary problems is a waste of time and energy. Maybe Flame Princess did hate the joke and is ghosting him. Maybe she just didn't get it. But either way, that moment has already happened, yet Finn is still trapped by it. He's dwelling on a situation and a possibility that he has no control over. Flame Princess might dump his ass later, or she could do nothing. By the way, it has no bearing on his life till it actually happens. So Jake's advice to Finn is to live his damn life rather than be held hostage by his thoughts. Then, to illustrate his point, Jake takes his favorite mug and chucks it out the window. Now it's gone forever, so it's not real, and I don't care about it anymore. Jake is giving Finn some solid advice, if through a very interesting way of demonstrating it. But Jake is right. You can either be concerned with what's affecting you or lose your mind thinking about what might affect you. But if you accept that something is gone, then you're free from its influence and are able to live in the moment. This is pretty much Jake paraphrasing one of the core beliefs of Stoicism, with this one being about differentiating between the things that are under our control and those that are not. Man, having a girlfriend is hard. No, being crazy is hard. Finn has invented a problem in his head, sulks about it, but doesn't take any proactive steps to potentially fix it like calling Flame Princess and busting out the A material. No, instead, what Finn is doing is just sitting here ruminating on a problem that he invented and letting it ruin his day. I don't even know what you guys are talking about. Finn naturally decides to ignore all that because he's 15 and decides being trapped in his head wasn't enough, so now he's just gonna go hide in his pillow fort and let his mind fester. And yes, he really does use the word fester. Festering's always bad, man. There's no good kind of festering. On some level, Finn knows what he's doing isn't healthy. But like my addiction to social media, he ignores solid advice to indulge in unhealthy habits. Venturing further into the pillow fort till he finds an isekai. Oh, 
That's it? Dude clipped into a different dimension, killed the boss, then got the girl. This is speedrunning at its finest, and like the knife storm, I can't explain any of this shit. The best inference we can make is that during the previous knife storm, the imaginary did become reality. But this alternate dimension is a massive escalation from what we've seen before. So I'm just gonna take Jake's advice and just go with it. Real or not, Finn is trapped here, with his request for help getting stalled by a party where his attempts to be antisocial and fester some more getting interrupted by PRB's one surefire cure, Horny. For that here too. <laughs> oh. This is Rosalind, the mayor's daughter and the only human-shaped pillow in town. So yes, Finn sleeps with a body pillow. But it's Rosalind that gets Finn to finally stop overthinking his problems, to stop worrying about things that he can't control or doesn't know the answer to. Yeah, Finn, he's trapped here. He doesn't know how to get back home. But that's not something he's gonna solve tonight. His head is running empty and in circles. The town will start researching a way to help him tomorrow. So you may as well stop worrying about what might happen and enjoy the moment. With a flash forward showing us that he apparently enjoyed the moment, maybe a little little too much, as now he's got a wife and two kids. Finally full grown, Finn has apparently stopped trying to get back home and is just enjoying the life he's built for himself with his family. Yeah, they're pillows and he's eating pillows, but he's living the good life. But then the hypothetical chance to return to his old life just gets dropped into his lap, which he's already two kids deep, but fuck him. Finn apparently uproots his entire family embarking on a quest to find a magic door that might lead him back home. Finn had a life some people can only dream of. He's got the wife, the kids, the bod. But he has ignored all that to focus on what he lost, spending literal years searching, and all he got was one less arm to show for it. But then he realizes that maybe, just maybe, he doesn't want to go back. All these years spent festering on why he's here, of how to get back, it all led him to ignore the life that he was building, not factoring how to get back he might have to abandon his family to return to a muddled memory, one that was so long ago he can't even remember his brother's face. Finn and wanting to go back is a natural reaction, but after decades of being here, he gained more and more reasons to stay. But he still remembered wanting it, and that was enough. But after years of festering, Finn is finally able to stop, refusing to waste any more time trying to get back to a life he could barely remember. You're not even sure I ever really existed? And I'm pretty sure I didn't look like this. Instead, choosing to embrace the life that he has, returning home with his family, with him getting to pass away years later surrounded by his loved ones, his wife, his grandkids, the proof that he got it in. And then he dies. And after death, he kickflips off the god of chaos, only to suddenly be back in the real world, having learned and grown from the experience to not dwell on things. However, before we start cheering, this supposed important lesson is complimented and deconstructed by Jake's own side plot. As the man... This is literally my favorite cup. <laughs> He is a hypocrite. Sure, Jake talked a big game about how his favorite cup was out of his life and therefore it doesn't exist or bother him. But while he couldn't see it, he still felt its absence, driving him to fish it out of the storm, proving him to be all quotes, zero receipts, as he can't even buy into his own lessons. He's unable to pretend just because it's an imaginary problem that it doesn't affect him, even if it's something as small as his favorite cup. With us digging a little deeper to find out that this is all just a symptom of an even bigger perceived failure. His parenting. Brainicorn babies age rapidly. They don't need their parents a couple hours after they're born. That really stinks. Huh? Mm. Context? Jake failed No Nut November, knocked up his girlfriend, got five reminders of his lack of pullout, but while shocked, shook, and not ready to be a dad, Jake stepped up, moved in with his lady, and tried to help raise his kids. Tried being the operative word. As regardless of the situation, Jake was actually super excited to be a dad, but his attempts at parenting boiled down to him just trying to be his mom, effectively wasting his kid's childhood trying to be someone else. He learned the lesson after only two and a half days, but at that point his kids were already old enough to dip, leaving Jake with an empty nest after imagining that this was just going to be a whole new chapter in his life, only for that chapter to be a short story. So he kind of just went back to his old life, the one that he left like three days ago. Jake was ready to settle down, to be a dad, but then that just kinda ended. They were there, then they weren't. The pups were out living their own lives, leaving Jake, Mr. I don't need a mug, to struggle to come to terms with what happened. As by his own words, this shit shouldn't affect him. It happened, they're gone, they're not in his day to day, so he shouldn't let this imaginary problem of the moments he thought he was gonna have with his kids affect him. 
but it does. Jake, for all of his solid advice, can't fully apply it to his own life because it's impossible. Nobody can just shrug and ignore something, just dismiss as not being a problem anymore. And if you can, congrats, you're a sociopath. But for everybody else, the absence of a thing can affect us just as much as its presence. He may not dwell on it as much as Finn does, but that doesn't mean he's at peace with the idea either. So maybe then, the answer that he should let himself dwell on it more, to sit down with a thing he wants to ignore, as even if what he lost was imaginary, to him, it felt real. Which is what gets to the heart of what I perceive to be the folly of Jake's own advice. As yes, logically, Finn shouldn't be bothered by what hasn't happened. Jake shouldn't be concerned with getting back a mug. Logically, it doesn't make any sense to waste time dwelling on what might be and what could have been, especially at the cost of ignoring what is. But that's the trick. The assumption that people can think logically and rationalize our feelings away. When really, to quote someone smarter than me who quote an actually smart person, when it comes to humanity in general, we are not thinking machines that feel. We are feeling machines that think. While it's a nice idea to think that we can just think our way out of a problem thinking got us into, all of that is to ignore the fact that what we think is a symptom of what we feel. That all-consuming, often irrational part of us that never really goes away. As we are messy, emotional beings. We may get better at managing and drowning them out with age, but that truth never really changes. So while we may not live up to some grand, higher ideal, it doesn't make us failures, it just makes us human. And it's finding that balance that's the real struggle. And I know for myself, and just to get a wee bit personal, as I have been in and out of therapy for most of my life. Anxiety disorders are the worst. The autism didn't help. But I think one of the biggest issues I've struggled with for so long is thinking that I could rationalize or explain away my feelings, my anxiety, which for me manifests in the tightness and just a hyper awareness of my throat. As I'm paranoid about having a panic attack, which yes, is a vicious cycle as my fear of it happening makes it more likely to happen. So when I was younger and a little bit now, I'd come up with any rationale possible to explain what was happening to me. I'd have some scheme or way to explain away what I was feeling. Imagine that I was sick and that the tightness in my throat was me about to throw up. Or the reason that I'm jittery and nauseous because I drank too much coffee and that's why I'm jittery yet somehow my head is a little foggy and frantic. I would just come up with all the excuses as I was trying to come up with an excuse and explain away what I was feeling. And I think a lifetime, a thing that I didn't get other people in social cues, ingrained in me a tendency to just overanalyze everything. Every text I sent, all the ones I didn't, how I'm perceived, what I'm feeling, and yes, especially my feelings. The paradox is that in trying so desperately to understand what's going on, I think I ended up understanding it less, and I end up becoming less present in the moment. So I very much relate to Finn festering on a joke that didn't land. But despite not having a whole pillow life to live, I think I end up with a similar solution, as dealing with my anxiety was a mix of medication, meditation, and acceptance. Accepting that I can't always explain or hyper-rationalize my every thought and feeling. But in trying to just pick apart my anxiety before it got too big, I only ever made it bigger. And it was by allowing myself to feel what I was feeling to embrace the anxiety that I was able to finally get through it. As more often than not, what I was worried about was truly unserious. Like there's this one time, I will always remember, I was fucking afraid of having a panic attack on a tour bus in Ireland. As it wasn't just me passing out, I was terrified of inconveniencing all these other people and having them think less of me, even though they were all strangers, so their opinions should mean nothing. Allowing myself to exist in that moment, to feel the anxiety allow me to recognize just the absurdity of the situation. I was freaking myself out because I was afraid of inconveniencing others. It's fucked up, but it's comedy, and I went from forced breathing exercises to giggling for 10 minutes straight as this, that was just S-tier masochism. As this was me making a problem for myself, and the problem was never as big or serious as it felt at first. But letting myself feel that made me realize just how silly the actual situation was. And that's kind of been the theme of my 2023. Learning to be more present, how letting myself feel won't make me crumble, but help me accept what's actually going on. I love the message of what Jake is trying to say at the beginning of the episode, to not let non-factors bother you and to not dwell on it. But I think the opposite of the message of what the show hints at is also true, that we do have to let ourselves feel these things. Maybe not overthink them and hyperfixate, but to actually feel what we're going through. Because even if they're scary and it seems all-consuming, letting that happen is how we grow and accept them. As after a certain point, trying to out-logic a feeling, you're just making the feeling worse. Also, the story isn't over yet. Yeah, we got one last twist and I'm absolutely not pivoting away from my own life. But Finn, having finally returned to his old life, talks a little bit about the weird dream he just had, only for Flame Princess to call and to tell him she finally got his joke, showing that all of his worries really were just for nothing. But then Finn just forgets everything that happened. 
Just promise me you'll remember us when you're back in your real life. Now what about this dream? What dream? The dream you were just talking about? Huh? Finn forgot the life he lived, which to me is tragic but also kind of brilliant, but also a perfect invitation to debate who was right in the end. As on one hand, you can see it as Finn finally internalizing the lesson he got from Jake. He left the pill world behind, he lived his life, and now they're out of his. <laughs> now it's gone forever, so it's not real, and I don't care about it anymore. So it doesn't really matter. On one hand, yeah, Finn remembering everything he lost could cause a lot of problems. He lost his wife his proof, and that can ruin a man. It would distract him from the present. So for Flame Princess to call and alleviate the impetus of his long, festering journey, he's freed from mourning a memory, cementing Jake's view about how we should not worry about things that don't exist, as his family definitely doesn't anymore. But while you can see the logic and view that as a happy ending of sorts for Finn, for him not to be burdened with these memories and emotions, there's something tragic about this as well. As Finn just forgot. He went back on his promise to his wife and rendering her and Finn's experience as meaningless. The episode, in its own way, is almost daring us to come to our own conclusions on just how valid Jake's advice ultimately is. As while great in the theoretical, we as people aren't really built for it. Though we do benefit from letting go of things and imaginary problems, there comes a point where you have to ask if forgetting is really the right answer. To act like something doesn't bother us when it really does. And trying to ignore it only makes it worse, costing us time and my parents tons of money. So maybe, just maybe, the things we want to ignore deserve more than that, and we should allow ourselves to mourn and feel that. Even if it costs us time and energy, it could give us closure, and that, more than anything, will allow us to better exist in the present. Jake trying to follow his own advice has left him with unresolved issues with his kids. Finn forgot and can't comprehend what he lost. While a lot of cases Jake will be right, I think the final conclusion is left up to our own interpretation. This episode is strange, it's surreal, and filled with such weird concepts like a man-pillow hybrid. But ignoring all of the weird trappings, you will find something truly special. This Adventure Time episode has always stuck with me for the long time, as it just hit me a certain kind of way, and I think it was only really while making this video that I was able to like unpack why it meant so much to me. Finn fucked a pillow, but everything else involved, yeah, it really deserved that Emmy. <laughs> Alright, that's all I wrote folks. Tell me what you all thought of this episode, hope everyone lets themselves feel what they're feeling. But also, tell me which Adventure Time episode has stuck with you the longest and why. As while Fiona and Cake may be getting a second season, that doesn't mean we should just forget the show that helped raise us. Or maybe we should. 